Hello and welcome to the Monday, July 17th, 2023 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. To start out, I just want to follow up a little bit on last week's Patch Tuesday. Cisco has a blog post that was released last Tuesday, but I don't think I mentioned it yet, that goes to a little bit more depth on these kernel mode driver signing issue that Microsoft addressed last Tuesday. To support legacy systems, Microsoft will accept cross-signed kernel mode drivers as long as the signature timestamp is set to a date before July 29th, 2015 and that's the real problem here that there is sort of this fallback so an attacker who somehow has obtained a signing certificate that was valid back in 2015 well uh, they can now just uh, backdate the signature cisco also states that they observed over a dozen of code signing certificates that are often being distributed as part of tools to create these uh, fake uh, certificates This is uh, available on GitHub. The blog post also suggests that thousands of malicious drivers are taking advantage of this particular uh, problem. The underlying vulnerability actually also still exists. Microsoft only added known exploited uh, signing certificates to a block list. So these are like the ones that Cisco found on uh, GitHub. According to Cisco, it can be helpful uh, to compare the compilation date of a driver to the signature date If it was signed before it was compiled, well, uh, then you probably have a problem. But of course, uh, that date can be faked too. But how do attackers obtain these uh, private keys? Uh, Researchers with uh, the Technical Hochschule in Aachen did analyze over 300 Docker images from Docker Hub and about 8,000 from private repositories. And well, they were looking for credentials that sort of come with these uh, Docker images. And they found that about 8.5% of these images do include secrets. They found about 50,000 private keys and uh, 4,000 API keys in the images that they looked at. They looked sort of For standard regular expressions, they also did exclude some common false positives here, which I guess is stuff like these sort of snake oil private keys and such that you often have as part of Apache, uh, for example. They also identified that uh, these secrets are actually being used in the wild. In particular, SSH keys uh, they found, and uh, they saw about 200,000 internet-facing systems that used SSH keys that they also found inside these uh, Docker images. Part of the problem here, I think, is that people are releasing these Docker images sort of pre-configured with keys, and uh, then the users of these Docker images don't realize that they probably need to swap uh, those sort of default keys that come as part of the image. So it may not be as much of a problem of these keys being leaked by the original creator of the image. To them, these keys may not really have any value, but uh, by then you know, making these Docker images public and lots of people are using them without altering the keys, well, uh, that may be part of the issue here, at least for the SSH keys. The API keys, of course, uh, could be more of a problem to the original owner of the API key. HelpNet Security has an article summarizing some social engineering threats around the new meta threats. As any big new piece of news, threats is being used by attackers to get people to either reveal credentials or install malware. One particular target that's sort of interesting, a little bit special here for threats is European users. Due to the excessive data collection performed on users by threats, well, threats is currently not available in countries with strict privacy rules. Most notably, Meta has so far not officially released threats in Europe. HelpNet Security also states that it may even be just not working if you are in Europe. So if you have threats installed on your phone, but uh, you use it from Europe, uh, it may get blocked. As a result, attackers appear to start offering threat clones to users. These clones do include additional malicious components, of course, 
and it's not clear how much of these clones actually, uh, how much they actually work if they're actual functional, functional threats uh, clients. Uh, many uh, threats related domains are registered as well and not uh, by uh, Meta, which uh, could be used then to configure phishing sites or distribute malware. Now, Meta has a pretty sort of good history in trying then to shut down some of these lookalike domains. And first has released a preview of CVSS 4.0. I often mention CVSS scores in this podcast. They provide a reasonable good idea of the criticality of vulnerabilities. So far, CVSS version 3.135 was in use last week. uh, First officially released version 4.0. Again, as a preview, they're looking uh, for some uh, feedback here. Whether or not you know some of the changes uh, they applied here worked. One of the ideas that version four emphasizes is that the CVSS score that you are seeing typically quoted with a sort of vulnerability announcement, well, that's just a base score, and uh, you need to adjust it for your environment, also for ongoing threats that may be coming out. Uh, there was a temporal score in the old version. They are now sort of more focusing on threats uh, that currently are attacking uh, this uh, vulnerability. There are also some sort of more granular definitions, for example, user interaction, well, whether or not this is passive or active, that'll also then affect your score. Well, that's it for today. I just want to say a big thanks to everybody who made the trek to Washington DC with all the travel problems people had uh, this week, which is sort of uh, typical, of course, uh, these days in particular, if you have the displeasure to have to travel by air. Uh, Thanks everybody who came out and attended any of the classes and talks. And uh, we'll hope uh, to see some of you again in future conferences. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.